to see ya Are you hot or cold? Laodicea No, you're just lukewarm Greetings, dearly beloved, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. UPA 7 welcomes you to our study this morning, and we pray that you will be blessed by it. Uh, UPA 7 South Africa will present Revelation chapter 12, the woman, the dragon, and the man-child. The aims of this study is to understand who is the woman clothed with the sun? What is the meaning of the symbolism? Has the earth opened her mouth yet? Is the current SDA church the remnant of her seed yet? Our text for meditation comes from Numbers chapter 16 verses 31 to 33. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, that their houses and all their men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. So here we see, back in Moses' time, we see that there was a, an event, a supernatural event, that took place where Dath and Abiram and Korah were trying to usurp Moses' office the Lord showed the congregation that he was on the side of Moses by opening the earth up and physically swallowing this whole situation. Their families and all the things that they owned and everything went down. Now let us be reminded of this story as we go into our study. Our main text comes from Revelation chapter 12. And this is our text for study. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared for her, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out, of the, out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation, and strength in the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Rejoice therefore, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, 
and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we want to understand what does all of this mean? Moons and suns and women and dragons and stuff like this. We want to unpack each of this symbolism in detail. We are aided to do this using these wonderful prophetic charts that show us these Bible symbolisms in a pictorial view. So we can see here that um, we see a sun there, we see a moon under her feet and stars. We see a woman clothed with the sun and a crown of 12 stars on her head. There's also a great red dragon which drew a third part of the angels with his tail. And we see also the seven heads of the dragon, the ten horns and the seven crowns as well. In the second view we see the same picture just with the two wings this time. We still see the woman clothed in the sun with two wings of a great eagle. And we'll unpack uh, the symbolism as we go. Just note the sun and this moon. So, what a woman symbolizes in scripture. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. Jeremiah 6 verse 2. This shows us that the daughter of Zion or the church is related to a delicate woman. Or put it simply that a woman in scripture represents a church. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with the gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. It is an admitted fact among Bible students that churches are symbolized by women. A pure church, as in Jeremiah 6 verse 12, is a pure woman. And a vile woman or corrupt church or a prostitute, as in Revelation 17, verse 4 and 5, represents a evil church. Is the woman the Christian church? If the woman represents the Christian church, how could the same church travail in birth with Christ, by whom the church was founded 30 years later? If we say she represents the Jewish church, how could she fly into the wilderness and remain there from 538 to 1798 in the Christian dispensation? If the moon under her feet indicates the end of the Mosaic sacrificial system, why did it not end before the birth of Christ, since the moon stood under her feet before he was born? If it had ended at that time, could it have been a symbol of the death of Christ? If her garment of sunlight is a symbol of the gospel in the Christian dispensation, how could the church be clothed with it years before the gospel dispensation began, having been clothed with it before the child was born? Which one of the two churches, Jewish or Christian, gave birth to Christ? If it were the Jewish church, then how could the light with which she was clothed be applied to the Christian church? If these questions cannot be answered, then we are obliged to go deeper into the subject. You see here, Men have many theories, lots of theories regarding this prophetic symbolism. But let us have a look at all of these things and trying to answer these questions as we continue with our study. The woman in both periods. The idea advanced that the woman is a symbol of the Christian church only and the moon of the Jewish ceremonial system proves incorrect. The Christian church was founded about 31 AD or not earlier than 27 AD, at which time Christ began to preach, being about 30 years of age. Therefore, the symbol points back at least 31 years before the beginning of the Christian church, for the woman church was travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. The evidence proves that the symbol of the woman takes in both periods, BC and AD. Therefore, as the moon was under her feet before the birth of Christ, it must be a symbol of a period of time which had preceded the Jewish church. As the woman was clothed with the sun before she brought forth the child, it is evident that the symbol 
clothed with the sun, was fulfilled before the birth of Christ. If the moon is symbolical, then the symbol of the sun must be the main object, for the moon depends on the sun for light, and the woman was clothed with it. Thus, sun and moon must be taken into consideration. In Genesis 1 verse 16, we are told that the sun and the moon are to rule the day and the night. The sun therefore must denote a period into which God's church had been given great light, and the moon must be a symbol of the preceding period. So here we see that the sun must be a symbol of, of something which gives God's church great light, and the moon must be the period which came before that. So let us dig a little bit deeper. The woman, the moon, and the sun. We must Find two such periods that would perfectly fit the symbols. The first is the one before the Bible came into existence, and the second is the one with the Bible, clothed with the light, the written word of God. Thus, symb symbolically, the first period may be called night, ruled by the moon, and the second day, ruled by the sun. Therefore, the woman clothed with the sun and travailing with child is the period after Israel went out of Egypt, and at that time, the period without the Bible, the moon was passing away. So we see that the moon is, a, is the period with, without the Bible represented by the moon, and the period with the Bible represented by the sun. The great light cannot be the gospel of Christ in the New Testament, neither can the moon represent the ceremonial system under the Jewish economy. For the woman was clothed with the sun, and the moon was under her feet while the ceremonial system was yet in existence. For the child was born after the woman had been clothed with the sun. Christ himself, by eating the Passover, just before his crucifixion, established the fact that the ceremonial law was in existence 34 years after his birth. So you see, these facts prove that people have misapplied and misunderstood these prophetic symbolisms. And this is just showing us and proving to us that that man's theories never hold water. And when the true prophetic timeline and symbolisms have been unlocked and unsealed, we can then understand these things. Who brought forth the Son of God? It was the Jewish church that brought forth the Son of God and not the Christian. Therefore she, the Jewish church, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. That is, the promise was made to Israel that the Messiah was to be born through that nation, by that particular church, the old dragon, knowing the channel through which the child was to come, closely watched with intention of destroying the promised one as soon as he was born. It was then that the dragon, by the hand of Herod, slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coast thereof, hoping to do away with the coming king. We see the story in Matthew 2 verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wrath and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So here we see that by the hand of Herod, the dragon was ready to devour this child that was born. And we can see it was the Jewish nation that gave birth to the Messiah, not the Christian. But let us have a look at our our prophetic chart here. If we look at um, this on the timeline, we see that the timeline starts at the creation. Then we have this whole moon period, which is the period without the Bible. And we can see that as they started to come out of Egypt, the light started to shine. And then sometime after that, we can see that the Jewish church was fully emitted with the light of the Bible and that the church itself was clothed in these rays of light. And then we see that the rest of the remaining period is the period with the Bible. So the, the period with the Bible has been shining on the church for a long time now. Two wings of a great eagle. We shall bring forth another proof from the different angle, making doubly sure of the idea that the woman represents both periods, before and after Christ, and that the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, from the face of the serpent. 
Note that Chu was given two wings of a great eagle. If the wings were not symbolical, what their object? As the wings of the lion and the four-headed leopard of Daniel 7 represents periods, then the two great wings must denote two great periods of church history, the eagle being king of birds, and as it is emphasized that they were of a great eagle, it is evident that the symbol must comprehend each period from its beginning. Thus, one of the wings taken takes in the entire church history from the fall of Adam to the crucifixion of Christ, and the other from the crucifixion to the end of this present world. Thus it proves that there is only one true church in all ages. So here we're getting to understand that this woman represents the church throughout probationary time. Those wings denote a period in church history. On the left hand side we see that the church starts from the Garden of Eden and extends all the way to the crucifixion. We see a cross in the middle of the woman. And then the second wing to the right represents the church in the New Testament period or after death period, AD period. There is like a banner here saying that from the beginning it says the church without the Bible. And we can see that's in the moon period. So we can see that this moon period is showing us that the church was out the Bible and then at the beginning of the Jewish church we see that there's a part where you know it didn't have the Bible but then it start the Bible did start to come out and we can see that by that slant there. Very interesting. Then we have the crucifixion and then after that we have the apostle church, then we have the church in the wilderness for twelve hundred and sixty years, and then we have the church back from the wilderness. So this is clearly showing us that the moon represents the period without the Bible and the sun represents a period with the Bible. Crown of 12 stars. Her crown of 12 stars originally represented the 12 patriarchs and later the 12 tribes of after they went out of Egypt, at which time the wonderful light shining from the written word of God, the Bible, clothed the church woman while she was travailing with a child, the promise of the Messiah. But the crown of the twelve stars in the New Testament period stand for the twelve apostles. Number twelve is a symbol of government. Jesus said to them, Ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Thus, this fact is proven by the type, the twelve tribes. So we see that the twelve stars in the Old Testament equals the twelve patriarchs and the twelve tribes. And the 12 stars in the New Testament equals the 12 apostles. Types and symbols. It will be noted that in the reckoning of the tribes of spiritual Israel, the 144,000, by the type Israel after the flesh, as in Revelation 7 verses 5 to 8, the tribe of Dan is missing, and instead the tribe of Manasseh, the firstborn son of Joseph, is numbered. The type corresponded, corresponds perfectly with the antitype, for Judas Iscariot, being one of the twelve apostles, was cast aside, of whom Dan is a figure, and in his stead Paul of Tarsus was added, of whom Manassas is a figure. Therefore we see perfect harmony in type and antitype. The lesson in this instance, by these unmistakable symbols, teaches that God has had only one church, one truth, and one way of salvation in all generations. The same is also expressed in the words of Paul. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So here we see interesting types and symbols here, how the tribe of Dan is missing, and the tribe of Manasseh is brought in, and we get told here that Judas Iscariot being of the twelve was cast aside and he represents Dan and then Paul of Tarsus who is represented by Manassas was brought in. I think that's truly amazing and stunning. Amazing how God works. Symbols by two women. God's church has been symbolized also by earthly objects. We speak of the symbols by women, namely Hagar and Sarah. The former is a symbol of the Jewish and the latter of the Christian church. These earthly symbols point out God's church in different sections and conditions. 
But the woman clothed with the sun and her eagle's wings being of a heavenly origin, denote, denote God's true church, truth in one continuous line, and her child, our only saviour and the redeemer in both periods before and after Christ. So here we see that Hagar represents the Jewish church, Israel after the flesh, Abraham um, establishing a son in his own way, and then Sarah represents the Christian church, Israel after the spirit, where Sarah miraculously at an old age gave birth to Isaac. The 12 stars. In reality, the 12 stars on the woman's crowns originally, originally represented the 12 patriarchs, later the 12 tribes of fleshly Israel after the 12 apostles, and last the 12 tribes of spiritual Israel, the 144,000. Thus again it proves that number 4 to be an important number, and that by the woman these four periods are represented. The 12 patriarchs, the 12 tribes, the 12 apostles, and then the 12 tribes of spiritual Israel, the 144,000. Satan floods the church with tears. Flood is the same as water, which means people in the church unconverted, whom Satan is using to cause the church to be carried away in a very quiet manner, so that no one would be suspicious of the great deception. In this way he attempts to deceive the very elect, the 144,000, if it were possible. Being impossible, Christ himself interposes and delivers his people, those who sigh and cry for all the abominations in the church, and then makes an example of the others. We read from Great Controversy, page 384, paragraph 5. To secure converts, the exalted standard of Christian faith was lowered, and as a result, it carried with it its customs, practices, and idols. If you read the whole of Great Controversy, page 384, you'll see that it's Satan that brings in this flood. So here we see that Satan is the one that has been flooding the church with tears, and the church is now flooded. Has the earth hope opened her mouth yet? And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. The meaning is that they die, being buried in the earth, as in Numbers 16 verse 32. The earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. Thus the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Isaiah 59 verse 19, last part. This will fulfill Matthew 13 verses 29 and 30. Let both the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest. The separation will mark the beginning of the harvest, which is the loud cry of the third angel's message. Revelation 18 verse 1. The Spirit of God is poured upon His people, those who escape the ruin, and the promise is that it shall never depart from them. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My Spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of my mouth, nor out of my mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. Read Isaiah the Gospel Prophet, volume 3, pages 43 to 49. All right, so we see that the earth is to open her mouth, which is the separation of the two classes in the church, the wheat and the tares. And this brings us back to Ezekiel chapter 9, where we see that there will be a separation of the two classes in the church. So the question is, has the earth opened her mouth yet? As soon as the separation is finished and Satan has lost out with his deceptive scheme, the church finds herself in great conflict with the enemy. Revelation 12 verse 17 And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, those who are left, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The war against the woman is the Sunday laws. The earth has not yet opened her mouth to swallow the flood. We are living between Revelation 12 verse 15 and Revelation 12 verse 16. The dragon is yet to make war with the remnant of his seed. So we can see that the Seventh-day Adventist church is not yet the remnant that is talked about in Revelation 12 verse 17. It is still commingled with wheat and tares. And once this opening of the mouth happens, which is a separation of these two classes, only then will the remnant come about, and only then will the dragon make war with the remnant of his seed. Has the dragon been wroth yet? 
Since the history of the church is such, and the last section, the Laodiceans, is in a worse condition, and under greater condemnation than any previous one, and as there is no time left for calling out a new movement, then a message of amazing light and stern rebuke through the word of God, which manifests with manifestations of divine judgments, is the only remedy that can bring true conversion and reformation, thus preparing a church to stand without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, of which only can be said, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and the, ch the church as a body, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It is the purity of the church that incurs the wrath of the dragon. Only after the earth has opened up her mouth will Satan be wroth with the church and make war with the remnant. So we can see that, that this hasn't taken place yet, but these events are imminent and about to take place. Our study summary goes as follows. The woman represents God's church in both Old and New Testament periods or BC and AD periods. The moon represents a period without the Bible and the sun represents a period with the Bible. Thus one of the wings takes in the entire church history from the fall of Adam to the crucifixion of Christ and the other from his crucifixion to the end of this present world, second coming. The crown of twelve stars represents the twelve patriarchs, the twelve tribes, then the twelve apostles, and then the 144,000, the twelve tribes of spiritual Israel. The earth has not yet opened her mouth to swallow the flood, and it is the purity of the church that incurs the wrath of the dragon, and he goes to make war with the remnant of his seed. This brings us to the end of our study. I pray that you have been blessed by this. We see now that these beautiful symbolisms that God has given to us and God has explained to us by, by use of prophetic symbols has come to unlock these things for us. So we thank the Lord for showing us these things. May you be blessed on your journey for truth. God bless. For more information, if you have any further questions, comments, or would like to request an outline of the study as a PDF document, Obtain a print copy of the original tract literature that gives the complete details on this most important subject, or to arrange for a formal Bible study at your convenience. Please contact us in South Africa or Zimbabwe, America, Vanuatu, Zambia or Malawi. We have contacts in each of those locations. So please also visit our websites as well as our YouTube channels where you can find all the latest in terms of controversies and what is happening in the Seventh-day Adventist Church today. May the Lord bless you in your search for truth. Amen. Laodicea Are you hot or cold? Laodicea no, you're just lukewarm Cause in the end Are we hot or cold? Cause in the end There's only hot or cold In the end Are we hot or cold? Cause in the end there's only heart, no.